Loud this week, and it is called Dragon Slayers Academy, The New Kid at School. So we just finished talking about the setting. So as we are reading this, you need to be looking at your slide, your red slide, that has your boxes and your bullets about the setting. And you're thinking about the time period, the magical elements that may appear, the weather, the landscape. So the first thing I want you to do is I want you to look at the cover. What do you notice about the cover? I see a castle, which is a great indication of the time period. You can look at the way that the main character is dressed. So just jot down some things on your red slide about the observations you've made about the cover. And as I'm reading, I want you to continue filling in your boxes and your bullets about the setting. Chapter one. Knock, knock. Who's there? Fergus bellowed from inside the hovel. A poor minstrel came a voice from out in the blizzard. Hmm, so I'm already thinking a couple things. I see the word hovel, minstrel, and blizzard. A poor minstrel who, Fergus called. Please, I am freezing, cried the minstrel. This is no time for a joke. Pity, Fergus yelled. There's nothing I like better than a good knock-knock. He yanked open the door. There stood a snow-covered man with a lute and a pack slung over his shoulder. Icicles hung from his nose and ears. His lips were blue from the cold. Be gone, varlet, Fergus shouted through his dirty yellow beard. There is no room here. Fergus spoke the truth. His whole hovel was but one cramped room, which he shared with his wife, Molina, and their 13 sons. 12 of these sons were big, beefy lads, with greasy yellow hair like their father's. They scowled out the door at the minstrel, shouting, Be gone! Be gone! But the third eldest son, Wigloff, was different from his brothers. He was small for his age. He had the hair the color of carrots, and he could not bear to see any creature suffer. When Fergus reached out to slam the door in the shivering minstrel's face, Wigloff grabbed his arm. I hope that you're writing down some notes because we've learned some very important information already. Wait, father, he said. Could not the minstrel sleep in the pigsty? I see sing songs and tell fortunes, the minstrel offered. Songs? Fortunes? Fergus growled. Pig droppings. I also chop wood, shovel snow, slob pigs, rake dung, scrub floors, and wash dishes, the minstrel added quickly. Oh, but we have Wigloff to do all that, Molina told him. Please, the minstrel begged through his chattering teeth. There must be something I can do in return for a roof over my head. Fergus scratched his beard and tried to think. He might kill rats for us, Fergus, Molina suggested. Wigloff won't do that. Wigloff feels sorry for the rats. One of the younger brothers told the minstrel, Wigloff won't squash a cockroach, another brother tattled. He won't even swat a fly. So we've already learned a lot about Wigloff, that obviously with all his brothers, he's the only one that's doing the work around the house, but we also see his love for animals, that he won't even hurt a fly. Wiggy never wants to kill anything, complained a third, I was pulling the legs off a spider once and... I have it, Fergus bellowed suddenly. The minstrel can kill rats to earn his keep, he grinned. Show him to the sty, Wigloff. So Wigloff did just that. And later on, he took a bowl of Molina's cabbage soup out to the minstrel for his supper. Ah, hot soup to warm my cold bones. The minstrel took a sip. Gosh, he cried and spat it out. It is foul tasting at first. Wigloff admitted, but you'll get used to it. I must or I shall starve, the minstrel said. Talk to me, lad, while I try to get, get it down. Then he held his nose and jammed a spoonful into his mouth. 
You are lucky to bed out here with the pigs, Wigloff told him. The sty smells far better than our hovel, for my father believes that bathing causes madness. Ew, gross. And Daisy here, he patted the head of a plump young pig sitting next to him. She is my best friend, in far better company than my brother's. They only like to fight and bloody each other's noses. Wigloff rubbed his own nose. It was still tender from one of his brother's fists. They gang up on me something awful, he added. Then they call me a blister and a runt, because I will not fight back. I know it is foolish, he went on, but sometimes I dream that one day I will become a mighty hero. Would that not surprise my brothers? No doubt it would, the minstrel said. He jammed one last spoonful of soup into his mouth. Then he burped. Ah, that's better. Now, my boy, I know some tales of mighty heroes. Would you care to hear one? I would indeed, Wigloff exclaimed. No one ever told Wigloff a tale before. Oh, Molina sometimes told him what she would do to him if she, if he did not wash the dishes. And Fergus often told him how he was no use at all in the cabbage field. But those tales were not so much fun to hear. Again, I'm going to stop and I'm going to think, like, how is Wigloff treated by his family? Wigloff settled down in the straw next to his pig to listen. The tale was indeed about a mighty hero, a hero who tried to slay a dragon named Gorzil. When at last the minstrel came to the end, his voice dropped low. Then Gorzil roared a roar of thunder. Bolts of lightning shot from his nose, and from out of the fire and smoke came a crunch, 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 and a mighty gulp. When the smoke cleared, the knight and his steed were gone, the minstrel said, but Gorzil was sitting high on his pile of gold, using the knight's own sword for a toothpick. No, cried Wigloff. Tis true, the minstrel told the boy. My grandfather was a dragon hunter. He saw it happen with his own two eyes. Well, with his one good eye, anyway. Pray tell, Wigloff asked, who finally killed this dragon? Oh, Gorzel is still very much alive, the minstrel grew thoughtful. My grandfather told me that every dragon has a secret weakness. Take old Snart, for instance. For years, that dragon set fire to villages for sport. Then one day, Sir Gulfer stuck out his tongue and said, na 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 poo poo you old sissy. Well, old Snart hated to be teased. He began whimpering and crying until he collapsed in a pool of tears. He hardly noticed when Sir Gilford sliced off his head. And what is the dragon Gorzel's weakness? Wigloff asked. That, said the minstrel, no one knows. He picked up his lute. I have written a song about Gorzel. Listen. Gorzel's a dragon, a greedy one he is. From his jaws of terror, villagers do flee. Gorzel burps up clouds of smoke, shoots lightning from his snout. Where, oh, where's the hero? Who, who will find his secret out? From that night on, Wigloff brought the minstrel a bowl of cabbage soup for supper. In return, the minstrel told Wigloff many a dragon tale, and he taught the boy many a useful skill, how to stand on his head, how to wiggle his ears, and how to imitate the call of a lovesick toad. So we're going to stop right here, and we're just going to kind of analyze our character and think about Wigloff, right? We know that he wants to be a mighty hero. And we know that the reason Wigloff wants to be a mighty hero is because he wants to demonstrate that he is of value to his family. And then to add on to this idea, I'm not convinced that this is possible because of Wigloff's weaknesses. If I think about what I know about Wigloff, like, he's afraid of everything. Like, how is he going to become a mighty hero if he's afraid of everything? I don't know. Well, I guess we'll have to find out. By the time the snow began to melt, he had even taught the boy how to read and write. So he didn't know how to read and write up until this point? 
Then one spring morning, Wiglaf brought the pigs to their slop and found the minstrel packing. Are you off for good? Wiglaf asked sadly. Ah, lad, a minstrel must wander, the minstrel explained. And, he burped, eat something besides cabbage soup. But here, give me your hand. Before I go, I shall tell your fortune. Wiglaf laid out his palm. The minstrel studied it for a long time. What do you see? Wiglaf finally asked. Something I never thought to see, the minstrel replied. The lines on your palm say that you were born to be a mighty hero. Me? Wiglaf cried. Are you sure? The minstrel nodded. In all my years of telling fortunes, I have never been wrong. Imagine, Wiglaf exclaimed. But what brave deed will I do? That, said the minstrel, you must discover for yourself. Now, I must be off. I shall miss you, Wiglaf. Wait, Wiglaf said. He reached into his tunic and pulled out a tattered piece of cloth. This is all I have left of, well, of something I had when I was very young. I carry it with me always for good luck. He held the rag out to the minstrel. Here, I should like you to have it. Keep your good luck charm, Wiglaf, the minstrel said, sh shouldering the salute. The road a hero travels is never an easy one. I fear you shall need much luck. And with that, he is gone. So quickly, let's think about the point of views and some other notes, right? We have the point of view. <clears throat> it's going to be that the third person, the narrator is telling the story. So that no, that means we know a lot about the characters. And we also know that Wiglaf thinks he's going to be a mighty hero and that the minstrel believes in Wiglaf. And because it's third person, all knowing, we can know what all of the characters are thinking. Tune in tomorrow to find out what happens in Chapter 2.